Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm Janet Napolitano. Uh, I previously served as the president of the University of California, Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, but now I'm a professor at UC Berkeley's Goldman School of Public Policy, uh, where we are establishing a new center for security and politics. And we're excited to host today's series of events on the timely and important topic of free and fair elections. Our third panel today focuses on what new or existing tools and strategies can be deployed to further improve the integrity and security of US elections. This panel will be moderated by Henry Brady, Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley, a leading expert on the practice and politics associated with the US election process. Henry, thank you for leading us in such an important discussion. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Janet. It's great to be here. Uh, and it's wonderful to have you as part of the Goldman School. Uh, we're so pleased to have this new security in politics center at the Goldman School dealing with such important topics. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished speakers, let me note that uh, you can ask questions uh, for those out there watching. Uh, and you can do that by submitting them using the form on the Goldman School's website that you use to register. So please uh, submit questions. Uh, our distinguished panelists, let me start and go through them alphabetically. Our first panelist, Cami Foote, is currently serving in her third term as the clerk, recorder, and registrar of voters in Inyo County, California. And during her long tenure in public service, Cami has testified before the California legislature and the Little Hoover Commission about improving elections. Uh, Cami, I think I'll go to you and then I'll introduce each speaker uh, as they come up. So uh, please tell us about your experience there. But before doing that, actually, let me just do a short introduction uh, and talk about trust in elections. Um, first of all, who am I? I'm the Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy. I was involved with the butterfly ballot episode in Palm Beach, California, in Palm Beach, Florida in 2000. Uh, in 2003, I was involved with a court case to get rid of Votomatic style punch cards in California. And that case temporarily delayed the 2003 recall for a little while because of worries about the Votomatic style punch cards. And then on April 18th, 2005, I testified before the Carter Baker Commission to try to improve elections in America. So I've had a long experience for the last 20 years with elections. Let me just say what the basic problem is here. The basic problem, it seems to me, is loss of trust. We've seen a loss of trust in government. And now more recently, we're seeing a loss of trust in many different kinds of institutions, uh, including science, higher education, the press, religion, medicine, and now elections. And it's not that there's been suspicions about elections in 2000. There were certainly those who worried about whether the election uh, results were fair uh, and right. But if you go look at the data from that period, people were much less untrustworthy. They were much more trusting of the election result than they are today. Um, thus, the polling firm Morning Consult in late January of this year found that only 60% of voters trusted the election, either some or a lot. 40% basically didn't trust the results. And that was 82% of Democrats trusted the results, not surprisingly, uh, President Biden won and 33% of the Republicans, only 33% trusted the results. And this just demonstrates what's even worse. It's not only that trust in institutions has declined, it's that it's become polarized. One side believes in particular institutions and the other side doesn't. Democrats tend to believe in science, higher education and the press. Republicans believe in religion, the military uh, and uh, institutions uh, of that sort. Um, and now we have this division between the two parties with respect to elections and a really deep seated distrust on the part of Republicans. Let me just say another word about what is an election. We sometimes think, well, that's just people going to the polls or they're filling out their mail-in ballot. In fact, it's much more than that. It also involves a period after the election generally called the canvas or the certification of the results. And in this period, all the results are checked, corrected, and finalized. Uh, and the period for this can be quite long. Uh, some states do it in a week. Vermont, South Dakota had deadlines this last election. 
uh, a week after the November 3rd election, but some as much as five weeks later, Maryland, Missouri, New Jersey, and California is one of those late states. And what's the reason for this? The reason is it's really difficult to count all the ballots on election night. The only reason we even try is because the media have historically wanted results quickly. And in fact, television really pushed for this. And television is one of the reasons why we introduced votomatic style punch cards, which allowed computers to count the votes, and why we have continued to invest in technologies that will count things quickly. But there's no reason to think that counting quickly is necessarily going to get the right result, especially now when we have so many mail-in ballots um, and all and early votes and all sorts of other modalities by which people vote. So in fact, it makes sense to think it'll take a little while to figure out exactly what the right count is. Now, what do we want to do with the right count? Well, first and foremost, most you want to convince the loser that he or she lost. Typically, the winner is convinced that he or she won, uh, rather or not that person did for obvious reasons, but it's the loser that has to be convinced. Now, increasingly, we also have to convince the public and that's a much bigger job. And how do you do that? Well, one way is just to invoke the authority of the government, but we see that that's no longer probably enough. Another is the cultural belief that the society would not let fraud occur. That's been destroyed by communications which have undermined trust in elections. A third way is that norms have been met, such as lawsuits have been submitted, they've all been rejected, and therefore, since the norms of the legal system have been met, the election must be fair and correct. We see that that didn't work so well. So now we're going to talk a lot today, although not exclusively, about the performance of the system and how we can prove it to be adequate. And the question is, is how can we do that? How can we reestablish trust in elections? And let me start with Cami, who I just introduced a few moments ago, who is the clerk recorder and registrar of voters in Inyo County, California. And then we'll go to our next speaker. Thank you so much for having me. So a little bit more about the area where I administer elections. Inyo County is the second largest county geographically in California with over 10,000 square miles. And we have a little less than 11,000 registered voters. So we're very dispersed in nature. And as an election administrator, I have directly overseen 22 elections, including this past November election. Prior to that, I was a poll worker for several years. Uh, we also have five Native American sovereign nations within our county boundaries, that made up of the Paiute, Shoshone, and Timbisha governments. And we are the one of the most purple counties in California, I would argue maybe even in the nation. And there are 14 vote difference between President Biden and former President Trump in the past presidential election. So while the accusations of vote rigging and machine manipulation are fresh in our minds um, in this last election cycle, I had more voters uh, also ardently believing that Russian voting directly led to the outcome of the 2016 election. So because of the nature of the area that I served of small knit and politically diverse communities who are often remote and distrustful of the government in general, it's necessitated that I seek out ways to demonstrate to voters that the elections were conducted properly regardless of trust. So essentially taking trust out of the equation completely. With that as a backdrop, um, I'd like to talk about the information pathways and data consumption. This is something that we've been talking a lot as an election community and as a nation in the form of dis misinformation. And then I wanna talk about a few additional steps that we can do now uh, across the nation in every election jurisdiction to actually secure the integrity of election administration itself. The reason I think it's important to start with how society consumes information is because we hear these same things brought up over and over again about misinformation and disinformation, but there's not a lot of talk about what we can actually do to solve the problem. But addressing this issue is really the largest security threat to elections as far as I can tell. So it's important to understand the mechanisms that are manipulating this flow of information. Uh, because this problem permeates broader society, as we just heard, it's not exclusive to elections. It's infected public discourse and policy in all areas of modern life. It's important to look at it from a holistic and systematic approach rather than just focus on elections specifically. Because until we address this larger problem, of partisanship and divisiveness that has gripped our culture on both sides of the political aisle, it's going to be almost impossible to have honest conversations about meaningful election reform. But we all know free and fair elections should not be a partisan issue. 
we should all agree that if you cast your vote for candidate A, that it should be counted for candidate A. So I personally believe that the first step to fixing this problem is going to be something akin to a internet bill of rights, something that we can use to protect voters and the general populace from predatory behaviors of nation states and campaigns and domestic troublemakers, all of the people and organizations that have been data mining what we like, what we love, our habits, who we communicate with, and taking that information to exploit us so that they can feed us mis and disinformation that's convincing to us personally that feeds into our own biases, fears, and anxieties. I think that we also need to be looking at things that um, surround the FCC regulations, things that were repealed in the 80s during the Reagan administration under this libertarian mindset. One of the things um, that was repealed during that time, I think if you grew up in my generation, you maybe saw commercials on television about uh, Schoolhouse Rock, how a bill becomes a law or the way that the government's structured. That was because regulation required that every media outlet set aside a certain amount of time for public education. And those are the kinds of reforms that I think we're going to be needing to address in order to focus on the misinformation and the way that we consume information, the way that we share information, and the way that we communicate with each other in this world of instant instant thought and instant connectivity. So now I want to pivot to what I will call my top 10 practical things that we can do in election administration now in every election jurisdiction across the country to help secure the administration itself and prove to the voters that the election is secure, again, taking trust out of the equation. To begin, because voting systems are certified at the federal and state level, we need to demand the highest level of security and transparency around the point of certification, including exploring ways to incentivize open source publicly owned voting systems. Because even though the software may be perfectly fine in all of our voting systems now, it might be cringeworthy, as a local election official, I can't prove it to the public because they're proprietary. So I really think we need to start focusing on the point of certification so that we can use systems that the public will accept and trust. At the local level, all election officials, they can become members of the Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center. That's a lot of words. We call it the EIISAC for short. It's free to join. And this is, uh, allows information sharing across federal, state, tribal, and local governments. And we have access to threat information in real time including resources to help mitigate those threats. Because 11 election administration, excuse me, election systems have been designated as critical infrastructure, we now have access to things like penetration testing, phishing testing, cyber hygiene, uh, Albert sensors, all kinds of information and resources from the Department of Homeland Security and no additional cost accounting. So there's no excuse for any election jurisdiction in the country to not avail themselves of these resources today. Every staff member should be trained in cybersecurity from beginner to advanced. That's something that my staff and myself have been through that, those courses. We need to be able to recognize appropriate ways to behave online. Anyone who works with, transports, counts ballots should maintain strong chain of custody documentation to prove that procedures are being followed. And these documents should be made public. They should be published on our website if possible. They should absolutely be made public to anybody who asks for them. Um, this should also include inventory tracking of election equipment, fund drives, all components of ballot counting. Also, with so much reliance on technology and the growing threat of rolling blackouts, fires, power safety shutoffs, any possibility that can take down the power grid, power backup generators should be the standard, not the exception. We installed them in all of our uh, polling places last election and they will remain. Uh, we should also be forensically monitoring our networks so that we can prove that no intrusions occurred and if they did we can discover what was accessed and when. We did that in Inyo County through the entire 2020 election cycle. We knew when the, there was any issue with our uh, internet connected systems, any, any of our networks, we were informed immediately. I also believe that hand-marked paper ballots with ballot marking devices only for those that need them are the best method to ensure voter intent. You're gonna be hearing from another panelist today who's probably gonna talk a little bit about that and instilled, um, did some, some 
some work to make sure that election officials like myself understood the threat with anything other than a handmarked paper ballot. Scanners should be equipped with imprinters that stamp the identifying information on ballots, such as the date, the time, the batch number, and the ballot order within the batch um, as they're being counted. We did that in Inyo County. This prevents even accusations of the same batch ballots being fed through the scanners more than once. And finally, at the culmination of documenting every other area of the election, once the canvas is complete and every voter record has been reconciled, every voter ballot has been counted, we should be adopting risk limiting audits, which are the gold standards for audits. So this is a non-exhaustive list. Um, funding is always uh, an option, but if we can do it here in Inyo County, you can do it anywhere in the United States. We're a very cash trapped county. We're very rural in nature, but it doesn't prevent us from having the highest levels of security that are available to us. And I just will leave you with one final thought that although I'm speaking to you today as a person who conducts elections, the most important position to hold in a democracy is that of a citizen. We as election officials serve you, the people, and without your advocacy and engagement demanding evidence based election systems and the highest security standing, standards and funding priorities, we're going to continue to struggle with these questions about legitimacy like we did in 2000, 2004, 2016, and yes, most recently in 2020. So let's work together to improve election security to avoid having to go through this as a country again in 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Cami. That was great. So we're going to talk more about risk limiting audits and train of custody and uh, the regulation of various machines and uh, how those all interact and why they might be important. So uh, if a lot of that seemed a little like some jargon, it is, and we're gonna do some of that today here, uh, but we'll try to explain it as best we can. My next speaker is Wayne Williams. He's the former Secretary of State uh, of Colorado, ending his term in 2019. Uh, Wayne also served as a County Commissioner in El Paso County and was then elected to the role of county clerk and recorder. And by the way, this is a role that's sort of standard across the nation. And often what happens is the person who's the county clerk and recorder does elections, but also records deeds and things like that. That's a fairly standard thing. Um, Wayne, please. Thank you for the opportunity to participate today. I apologize for being a little bit late like Secretary Napolitano. Uh, I am a former Truman Scholar and was chairing our regional panel and it went a little bit late today. Uh, but let me talk about why the elections matter. Uh, and, and so let's, and then I want to talk about some of the things we did in Colorado and I'll try and, and emphasize what I think are the most important parts of that. Uh, I first got actively involved in elections in 1997 when I served on a canvas board. I was one of uh, our county's three members, and we had the punch card ballots, and we had specific standards that said what counts and how many chads and how closely they have to be hanging and all of those things. And so a few years later, when I am watching uh, the process in Florida, where different people were advocating to change standards mid-course, uh, it began what I think has been a series of things that have undermined confidence in the election systems. Uh, and so, you know, one of those things is that as election officials, we want to make sure those standards are set well in advance so that everybody knows what those rules are going to be. Um, and then I've got six. So, so Cami is, you know, from California, they count higher than I count in Colorado. I've got six general things, but they're pretty broad. Uh, the first is something that, impacts anyone who's ever walked a precinct or reviewed a voter list, and that's that you need an accurate voter list. Uh, that's particularly true in a state like Colorado where we mail ballots to people. Uh, and so we use a host of different processes to make sure those are accurate. Uh, from gathering information from other government agencies, such as when you get a driver's license update uh, or your car registration changes, uh, from looking to make sure that folks who have passed away whether they're from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment or the Social Security Death Index, that they are removed from the voter rolls. Uh, we work with the Department of Corrections for those who are currently serving a sentence for a felony conviction. Um, we also check to make sure non-citizens are not registered. Uh, 
So these are objective things that counties and states can do. Uh, we actively participate in a, a cross-reference of our database with the Electronic Registration Information Center. So we're comparing our information to other states so that we can first be accurate on our list and second, ensure that that person who moved gets the correct information going forward. We get that information on a regular basis from the post office. So there's a host of things we do to make sure that information is accurate. And that's critical because that's something that's publicly available. And so if you get a publicly available voter database and you see that it doesn't match who lives there, that undermines that confidence. And so that's what, one of the reasons why that needs to be there. The second part of it, and Cami already talked about this, is having voter verifiable paper, paper ballots. And that means a ballot that the voter can actually look at and ensure. And, and this was one of the reforms that we adopted when I was Secretary of State of Colorado, uh, ensuring that we had a voting system that actually provided a paper record. Uh, even if you voted on an accessible device, there was still a paper record that could be verified by you, the voter, and by someone who wanted to audit results later. Absolutely critical. Uh, <clears throat> the idea that was at one point popular that you would trust the ether uh, or what is on uh, uh, a computer card is not uh, something that provides that evidence you need to ensure the election was conducted accurately. <coughs> Ultimately, I adopted standards that required that voter verifiable paper ballot. Not everybody was happy. Some companies that didn't make sufficient machines uh, sued. A couple counties sued. Uh, the legislature reviewed it. Uh, but then when it became apparent uh, four, five years ago now that foreign governments were seeking to interfere in elections, all of a sudden other people began to recognize uh, that it's there. Those of us in the election community are dealing with this on a daily basis. Some people only pay attention when there's a crisis. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we are engaged and that we can explain what we're doing. The third thing you need is a secure ballot return system. Uh, someone needs to be able to ensure their ballot gets back there uh, because, and, and this is one of the challenges in a state like Colorado that does vote by mail. Uh, we had uh, pre predominantly, you could only mail it. Uh, when I was secretary, we began to have drop boxes around the state. These made it much easier and ensured that the geographic disparities in mail service deliveries uh, were evened out. It also made it so that you could have total confidence because those drop boxes are under 24 seven surveillance and the ballots from them are picked up by a bipartisan team of judges. And uh, so that secure ballot return for a mail ballot state like us is important. And that's the perspective, by the way, I'm talking about in Colorado, everybody who's a active voter is mailed a ballot. Uh, there are some in-person options, but that's the perspective I'm talking about as I go forward. Uh, the fourth item in a mail ballot election is some form of verification. Uh, at the present time, I believe signature verification is the strongest one where we actually are able to say this was the vote cast by this person. The, the fifth item is a series of procedural protections. And one of those I alluded to already, which is that every step of the way we have bipartisan judges. Regardless of whether the clerk and or the secretary is from a particular party, the judges need to be across from across the political spectrum. And you need someone, you need Democrats and Republicans who are both there verifying the process every step of the way. And we also have watchers in Colorado in addition to the judges. By the way, we, uh, we changed the regulations when I was secretary to ensure that the parties were the ones choosing those judges. So it's not, so, so an election official can't just choose a friendly person from the other party to them. Uh, the parties are actually part of that so that they can have confidence. So I was at a discussion recently with a, Republican Party Executive Committee and, and they were raising questions about the election and I looked at the chair and said, who did you appoint to test the machines? And pointing out that yes, this process is one that is conducted uh, by the election official, but always with bipartisan teams of judges throughout that process. Uh, 
That also means that those, those procedural protections include not connecting machines to the internet uh, and ensuring that the, the security, and Cami talked about some of those issues, uh, is there uh, so that those are not tampered with. Uh, and then this, the sixth item, and, and Cami referred to this as well, is making sure that those results can be and are audited. And, and the purpose of all of these protections isn't just to make sure it's done right. It's also to be able to show people that it was done right. And, and as Henry was talking about in, that intro, in those introductory remarks, it's not the winners you have to convince. It is the people who lost the election and their supporters, and you need to have the evidence to back that up. One of the th other changes we made in Colorado is we made all of our ballots subject to the open records laws. So we aren't playing a, no, you can't see that, no, it's hidden, trust us, we got it right. It is a process that is open and verifiable, both through in a formal audit. So we adopted the nation's first a full statewide risk limiting audit, uh, but it's also available if you wanted to request every single ballot in the state and do your own hand count, by golly, you could do that in Colorado. And so we wanna be able to make sure that that process at every step of the way is verifiable. You've got bipartisan judges, you've got video surveillance, and you've got voter verifiable paper ballots that are audited and are open. So those are some of the things we've done in Colorado. Um, and certainly for all of us around the country, we're all going to conduct the elections a little bit differently. And that's fine. But all of us need to be able to show and demonstrate that those are that, that process is accurate and we need to be able to prove it, not just say, trust me, or as President Reagan used to say, trust but verify. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, Jennifer Morrow, our next speaker, has alerted me to another bit of jargon. Uh, I think, Wayne, when you say judges, you would, you're would you really meaning what we would call, in this state, at least poll workers. Is that right? That is correct. So thank you. Uh, I, we sometimes launch in. So poll workers uh, or people who help count the ballots uh, or who do any of the processes in Colorado, a county, you know, our, our, our largest population county has about you know, seven, 800,000 people. Uh, they've got an election staff of a dozen. Uh, and so there's no way they're doing it. So all of the work in the election, so whether you're called poll workers or election judges or whatever the case may be, those individuals are citizens from the community who come in and help. Uh, that's what helps make the election work. And none of us want a system that has so much bureaucracy, you don't have that help. Plus, it's an opportunity to make sure that both parties have representatives at every step of the way. So yes, poll, poll workers, election judges, ballot judges, whatever the term may be. So thank you for the clarification, Jennifer. And, and I would just also add that uh, good training for poll workers is a really important thing too. So that's something maybe we'll talk more about. Our next panelist is Jennifer Morrill, uh, who has served as a local uh, election official in Utah and Colorado, and is the partner in the elections group where she consults on election administration and auditing. She works as a consultant with the Democracy Fund, leading the Election Validation Project, which seeks to increase trust in election. Take it away, Jennifer. Great, well, let me start first just by saying thank you, uh, Dean Brady, Professor Stark. It's really an honor to be here participating in this conversation. Uh, what a great group. A little introduction just to tell you all how I got here and, and maybe set the stage for where we're at now. In 2009, I was a city council candidate on the ballot for a local municipal election in Utah. Three days before the election was to take place, things went a little sideways. And I was asked to withdraw my name as a candidate and oversee the election. I knew nothing about running elections and I spent the next 48 hours immersed in Utah's election code and on the phone talking to anybody who was willing to give me advice on what I was supposed to do. Uh, I promise there is a much better way uh, to be introduced to election administration, but this crash course and a long night of manually counting and recounting to ensure the totals and tallies were correct left me convinced that there were opportunities for improvement, uh, both in how elections are administered, but also reinforced that this was something I wanted to keep doing. 
it was, uh, and it continues to be an exciting puzzle to solve uh, with an endless array of challenges. So I spent several, several years working as a municipal clerk, uh, wearing many different hats besides election official, as Dean Brady alluded to. And then I moved on to oversee elections in larger jurisdictions of both Utah and Colorado. And it was during my time as the deputy of elections in Arapahoe County, Colorado, that I was introduced to the idea of risk limiting audits or RLAs as we often refer to them and, and we'll, I'll probably refer to them uh, from here on out. The fact that no one was able to easily explain to me exactly what an RLA was and what it did made me immediately wary of the idea. Uh, but by 2018, after playing a role in the first statewide uh, risk limiting audit in Colorado, which you just heard former Secretary Williams talk about, and Professor Stark assisted with, who uh, we'll be hearing from, I was really hooked. And I decided to leave running local elections to focus full time on pioneering election audits and evangelizing the benefits of RLAs. And, uh, some of you probably aren't surprised when I tell you uh, that well-meaning colleagues called to say, are you crazy? No one is going to be interested in election audits. How is that even a job? Uh, but I saw the impact it had, not just providing a way for me as an election administrator to validate that the election had been conducted fairly and accurately, but the requirements necessary to store and organize and account for ballots as a precursor to the audit meant that I had documented evidence of the number of ballots in our possession, and I could identify where each and every one of those ballots was located. More importantly, uh, and Cami mentioned this, I, I could balance that against the number of ballots issued and cast. So it provided this whole new perspective to election accountability and transparency. And I also found it fascinating when I first started thinking about the broader concept of election audits, the audits have played a role in US companies since the creation of the Security and Exchange Act um, in 1934. So essentially providing a way to ensure financial records and transactions are reported accurately and a system of internal controls is established and followed. Uh, I think that's something that allows all of us to feel confident about our financial and banking institutions. And we know many organizations today, both public and private, rely on audits to evaluate processes and internal controls. And so I started asking the question, why didn't we have similar audit standards uh, for elections? So I set out to write some guides uh, that would help state and local officials better understand what uh, an RLA is, how it works, the various methods that can be used when conducting an RLA, and what is required from both the voting system and operationally to conduct an RLA. And I tell everybody uh, that 80% of the work in conducting a risk limiting audit happens prior to the election. So there's a lot of uh, front end work that has to be put in place. So I ended up with four guides and they cover everything from policy to terms and definitions, how to conduct a pilot as a way to provide a hands-on experience for learning how the RLA process works and a guide to ballot accounting. And this is an area where there's still a significant need uh, for improvement in most jurisdictions. And in addition to these guides, I've had the opportunity to organize and conduct RLA pilot projects in several states. So speaking for a minute directly uh, to the academic community watching this, if you wanna see a policy or a tool or a strategy implemented, one of the best things you can do is connect with a practitioner, with an election administrator, and develop a pilot program where you can see firsthand what it takes to transform theory um, into practice. So, Moving forward to 2020, um, I, along with my business partner, formed the Elections Group, and we partnered with state and lo local election officials who were looking to implement new programs or improve processes. And our team of election experts, uh, all former election officials, were able to quickly provide guidance and resources and direct support for those jurisdictions in need. But this new avenue of work really gave me a front row seat in 2020 to experience how elections are run across the country, but also allowed me to see firsthand some of the challenges. Uh, and it became more clear uh, than ever that good election practices set the stage uh, for successful audits. Despite the challenges of 2020, uh, elected and appointed officials from both parties worked together 
to mitigate what really could have been a crisis, as we heard uh, in an earlier panel today. Uh, they did this by instituting health and safety protocols, recruiting and training hundreds of thousands of new poll workers, and expanding early and absentee voting and other alternative voting options, and processing and tabulating a record number of mail-in ballots. And I bring this up because I think it demonstrated a remarkable amount of resiliency, which should reassure all of us uh, as we're thinking about the challenges that we need to tackle around mis and disinformation and improving election security and integrity, uh, that the ability is there to meet those challenges. They also became expert crisis communicators, uh, many for the first time. With limited staffing, they did a remarkable job working to inform voters and the media and other stakeholders about the facts around how to vote and where to vote and when to vote. And they were really at the heart of a collaborative effort to amplify trusted information, which is really vital for us to keep in mind as we're exploring better ways of providing evidence that the outcome of an election is correct. Um, jurisdictions of all sizes provided us with virtual tours of their ballot processing facilities and created graphics and short videos explaining how each stage of ballot processing worked, how ballots would be secured and accurately counted, and what we could expect while we waited for results. So I think in addition to this being the most secure election we've ever had, in many ways, it was the most transparent of any election we've ever had. More local jurisdictions turned on a camera so that the world could watch the work they were doing in real time. And I think that effort revealed a couple of things. Uh, first, for those of us that have ran elections, this is no surprise, uh, that counting ballots is tedious, monotonous work. Um, and second, and, and maybe more importantly, uh, that this added transparency alone was not enough uh, and that we still have some work to do in educating the public on how the whole process works and more importantly we need to continue pursuing ways to provide evidence that the work was done fairly and accurately so i want to end my introduction by asking a question why should we audit elections and my answer is election audits and not just tabulation audits have the potential to detect voting system errors, whether that is a human error or misconfiguration or hacking. Uh, they provide accountability to voters. They can deter fraudulent activity. They help assure us that votes were issued and counted and reported accurately. And just as important, they provide feedback for process improvement, not something I really valued as an election administrator. And so the question we all should be asking is, why don't we have a uniform set of practices for conducting ele election audits across all states and jurisdictions? So there are three uh, quick areas I'll just touch on where I think there is opportunity to further improve the integrity and security of our elections. First, every election operation should have documentation. So this includes things like standard operating procedures, chain of custody forms, ballot reconciliation logs, and ballot manifests. Having a trustworthy paper record is essential, and I'm sure Philip's going to talk more about this. Uh, but having a trustworthy paper record starts by having written procedures and logs for every task that gets performed. Second, pre and post election testing and audits can provide a way to verify the work performed by staff and the many temporary workers and poll workers that are brought in to assist. Uh, as well as verifying how election equipment and software functioned. So those are things like um, that might include, uh, you know, regular maintenance of the voter registration database, as, as uh, Wayne mentioned, maybe someday systematic audits of those databases for anomalous changes, uh, GIS audits of the voter district and precinct assignments, compliance audits around security procedures, uh, both physical and cybersecurity, uh, Pre-election testing of the voting equipment to ensure it's been programmed correctly and it's operating as expected. Uh, tests of the ballot layout and, and design and resource planning and allocation audits. So essentially ensuring enough equipment, supplies and people have been allocated to meet demand. And finally, uh, we need to improve the way we use this documentation as a way to continue to inform how procedures work and improve how we present uh, those test or audit results as evidence, as proof 
that the outcome of an election is in fact correct. And I'll leave it there. And I'm really looking forward to the questions and the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. That was great. Uh, nice overview of uh, the issues. Uh, we're now going to go to uh, Philip Stark. He's professor of statistics at UC Berkeley. He's also associate dean for mathematical and physical sciences. He's received the Chancellor's Award for Research in the Public Interest uh, for developing election auditing method methods, risk limiting audits that have been incorporated into law in eight states. He currently serves on the board of advisors of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission that was set up by the Help America Vote Act uh, that came after the 2000 election. And he's also on the strategic board of advisors of the Open Source Election Technology Institute. Uh, Phil knows lots and lots about the details of how these methods work statistically and electronically. Phil. Thank you so much. Um, it's a delight to be here and a delight to share the uh, virtual podium with some of my favorite people in election integrity, uh, people I, I both trust and respect and enjoy. I guess that's trust and respect and enjoy more than two things. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, being an academic, I have to have slides to give a talk. Um, let me uh, see if I can make this happen. Oops, sorry. All right, I hope that's visible. Um, so Henry mentioned earlier that uh, an incredibly important goal is to improve public trust in elections. Um, I'm not good at that. Uh, the piece that I'm uh, good at is something that I think should come before the trust, which is the trustworthiness. Um, and my focus in this area has been trying to figure out how to make elections more trustworthy uh, and then uh, leave it to uh, others more skilled than I to, uh, to improve public trust. So I actually, think that there are aspects of the way we conduct elections in the US right now um, that make them less deserving of trust than they could be. Um, in particular, many of the aspects of the procedures and the equipment that we use um, are neither tamper evident nor resilient. That is, we can't always tell whether uh, something has been you know, altered, whether it's been misconfigured, whether there are bugs, whether, you know, whether there's been hacking. Um, and if we do discover a problem, we're not always able to recover what the correct outcome of the election would have been, but for the problem. Uh, we rely heavily on computerized systems for various aspects of elections, including uh, voter registration databases, electronic poll books, uh, the systems that are used to mark ballots in some cases, or, or actually instead of marking ballots, touchscreen interfaces for direct recording electronic voting systems, um, and then the systems that tabulate, aggregate, report the election results. All of those systems can be misconfigured, they can have bugs, they can be hacked. In order to provide evidence that the reported winners of the election really won, we have to have a way to check whether they won without trusting software or computers that were used to conduct the election itself. Um, so one of the most important things is actually paper. Um, and all of the speakers have mentioned this before, but it turns out that paper has some unique security prop properties that are not shared by electronic systems. It's tangible and accountable. Um, both uh, Cami and Jennifer uh, talked about this. You can keep track of how much paper you sent to a polling place and how much came back uh, voted, uh, unvoted or spoiled. It's tamper evident. Uh, it's not that you can't alter it, but it takes some work to uh, alter a voter's mark without leaving discernible traces. Um, and finally, and kind of most important, is that if you want to change a lot of votes that have been recorded on paper ballots, that requires physical access to the ballots and it requires accomplices if you're going to change many, many votes at all. That's very different from the electronic world where you can, where a single individual can change an arbitrarily large number of votes without any accomplices necessarily. <clears throat> but how the paper is marked, curated, and audited is crucial. Um, and if we create the paper trail using untrustworthy technology, then it's not clear what the paper trail is really providing us. 
Handmarked paper ballots are the, the best choice right now because they're a record of what the voter did. There are a lot of states that are moving to universal use uh, ballot marking devices. So that's where voters interact with a touchscreen and the touchscreen then prints a record uh, that's supposed to be a record of their selections. The problem with that is it's a record of what the machine did, not what the voter did. Voters uh, by and large don't notice if what's printed is different from what they intended. And even if they do notice, there's no way they can prove to a poll worker or election official that the machine misbehaved. Uh, and if the election official is convinced that the machine misbehaved, there's nothing the election official can do to figure out what the right outcome of the election actually is. So there's a lot of security problems with those. They do provide uh, additional accessibility for voters with some kinds of disabilities, and that's an important thing. Um, there's some evidence that many of these devices, in fact, are not very accessible. And I think this is an area where we really need to denote a lot more research uh, and attention to, to building uh, voting accessible ways of marking a paper ballot for voters uh, who can benefit from, from technological interventions there. If we don't keep the paper trail demonstrably secure, it's not clear why we should, uh, why having that paper trail should increase our trust in elections. Um, uh, Jennifer uh, and Cami both, both spoke about this, actually, um, uh, Wayne as well. And of course, if we never look at the paper trail uh, after tabulating the votes, it might as well not exist. And so that's where the auditing comes in. Oh, this is kind of like the carpentry slogan of, you know, measure twice, cut once. Um, this is sort of, you know, count twice, certify once. Well, you don't really need to count twice, but you do need to count a little bit more than once. And that's what, that's again, what auditing is about. So I would categorize the way we run elections in the United States right now as procedure-based rather than evidence-based. So uh, what the way the, the rules work, the way things are is uh, states have various procedures for certifying equipment. Um, uh, many rely on federal certification by the Election Assistance Commission. Uh, and then there's rules to follow for how to conduct the election. And at the end of the day, um, basically uh, the, the assertion is I use the certified equipment, I follow the rules, therefore the outcome of the election is right. And I liken this to a brain surgeon saying, um, I used a sterile scalpel, I followed a uh, proper surgical procedure, therefore the patient is fine. Um, I think we need to look at the patient to figure out whether the patient is fine uh, or not. And similarly, I think we need to look at uh, the way the elections are conducted and look at the paper trail in order to determine whether the outcome really is correct. <clears throat> oh, uh, some years back, 2012, David Wagner, who's in the EECS department here at Berkeley, uh, and I published this paper called Evidence-Based Elections. Uh, and the basic idea is that it's not enough for elections to identify who really won. It also needs to provide affirmative evidence that it really did find who really won. Um, and that evidence basically is a function of having auditability, that is having these paper records, keeping track of them and so forth, and then actually looking at them, auditing. <clears throat> so what is a risk limiting audit? Uh, that um, term has come up a number of times already today. It has a relatively simple definition. It's any procedure that has a known maximum chance of not correcting the reported election outcome if the reported election outcome is wrong. And moreover, it never makes a right outcome wrong. So that's, uh, that, that's a straightforward idea, I think. I mean, there's a lot of words there. It's a, it's a little bit tortured, but um, big chance of correcting the outcome if the outcome is wrong, only a small chance of not correcting the outcome if the outcome is wrong. What's the risk limit in a risk limiting audit? It's the largest chance that the procedure won't correct the reported outcome if the reported outcome is wrong. Typical values used as risk limits in actual election audits are you know, 10%, 5%, some cases smaller than that. <clears throat> um, it turns out that the amount of work, additional work you need to do to attain a smaller risk limit is not, um, is not always that, that, that much um, uh, in addition. So what does wrong mean? Wrong means that if you accurately tabulated a tr the trustworthy paper trail, you would find that someone else had won. Um, figuring out whether the, the paper trail is still trustworthy at the time of the audit involves other processes, and I call them generically compliance audits. 
Um, Jennifer mentioned a, a number of the things that uh, that uh, one would want to do to ensure that the paper trail is trustworthy. And these, of course, are not the only things that you would want to audit. Um, I think Jennifer also mentioned auditing things like ballot layout. You want to make sure that ballots are usable, um, that instructions are clear, uh, and so on. Um, making sure that eligibility determinations have been made correctly. Uh, this is uh, related to things that Wayne spoke about, making sure that you you have accurate voter lists and that you check, check things against them. Um, Right, so risk limiting audits have been pretty widely endorsed. Uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, Presidential Commission on Election Administration, the American Siskel Association, League of Women Voters, Common Cause, Verified Voting, uh, and others. Um, there have been on the order of 60 pilots in a bunch of states and Denmark. Uh, they've been routine in Colorado since 2017. Uh, it was under uh, former Secretary Wayne Williams, that they were actually implemented. Um, there was uh, a tortured time of, I think, more than five years between uh, when a law was passed and when and when uh, they were actually rolled out. There have been statewide audits uh, in a number of states that were actually orchestrated uh, by Jennifer. Um, and uh, there was most of a statewide risk limiting audit in Pennsylvania uh, quite recently. Um, there are laws in a number of states, and uh, there are methods that uh, can be used to do risk limiting audits of all the social choice functions that are currently used in U.S. elections, including plurality, multi-winner plurality, supermajority, uh, instant runoff voting, um, and, and things like that. Um, so to distill this all to a, a relatively short list, what do we need to have evidence-based elections? What do we need to be able to produce affirmative evidence that the reported winners really won? Um, voters have to create a complete, durable, verified audit, audit trail. The local election official, there's another acronym there, LEO, needs to care for the audit trail adequately to make sure that it stays complete and accurate. We need some compliance audits to check, to you know, confirm that the paper trail really is trustworthy because auditing an untrustworthy paper trail can't tell us whether the reported election results are right. And then at the end, we need risk limiting audits that will check or correct the reported results. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And and there, turn it back over to Henry. Thank you, uh, Phil. Uh, that's great. It's a nice uh, distillation of what's uh, actually a very, very sophisticated technique uh, to make sure that, in fact, risk limiting audits, for example, can be done most expeditiously and efficiently uh, because it, the whole point is that it doesn't require that you actually look at every ballot. You can just look at a certain number. And then at that point, you say, well, there's almost no chance uh, that we got it wrong. And therefore, we can go forward and assert that we've got it right. Um, so we have a great set of audience questions. Uh, one of my favorites here is, um, given the election security concerns raised by Professor Stark, will we ever be able to have voting by computer? Ever is a big word, but will we ever? I, I'm sorry, I missed the preamble to the question. I mean, we, we do use computers to tabulate votes and we use computers in many parts of elections, but we can't trust them to do the right thing. So we need to check whether they got the right answer. And that's where having this trustworthy paper trail comes in. It lets us do some manual work, visual, visual, you know, visually inspecting some often relatively small number of ballots uh, in order to confirm that the reported winners really won. By looking at just a random sample of ballots, we're not gonna be able to tell whether the tally is right down to the last vote, but that's not the point. We don't need to get the tally down to the last vote. What we need to know is, did the reported winner actually win? It's a much lower standard of accuracy, and that's what makes it possible to do with a relatively small inspection, by manually inspecting a relatively small sample of ballots. Yes, yeah, so let, me, let me follow up and uh, address what I think also might be part of the question is, can you, at the present time, we do not have the technology sufficient to ensure that the person at the other end of the screen is who they say they are, and at the same time, be able to ensure the anonymity of their vote. So this is different in elections than banking or anything else, because in banking, they're perfectly fine knowing who you are and what you did. In fact, you want a report of exactly the transaction you did. So doing banking online is a different thing. In elections, we're we need two things. We need to know it's you and that you did it, but we also can't have the government know how you in particular voted. And right now, the technology does not exist 
in a way that is secure and verifiable to do both of those things at the same time. Uh, the question was ever, look, I, my, my grandfather was born in 1899 when there was horse and buggy, and by the time he died, people were landing on the moon. Uh, so certainly things can change, but it's going to take... It's going to take a lot to convince, and it should take a lot to convince, uh, that something can be completely secure. Because computer security is a never-ending battle. As soon as you, def if look, you, you've got a computer, it, every few weeks, or sometimes more often, it gives you an update because they found some security vulnerability that needs to be addressed. You, you can't be doing, first, that computer can't even be connected to the internet if you're doing it right in an election. And, and so we just do not have that technology or ability to provide that completely secure system. We're comfortable with a few errors made in banking. Uh, it's part of the process they use and they insure against that and they plan for a certain amount of lossage. And when you call up and say, hey, that wasn't me and they reverse the charges on something, you can't do that in an election. And so we're not at the point yet uh, with our need for 100% accuracy uh, and verifiability at the same time as we have anonymity. Those are at least my thoughts. Thanks, Wayne. I'm trying to think if there's any votes that I'd like to have reversed uh, historically as I think back through my voting career. But nevertheless, uh, uh, let's go to the other end of the process. How can we make it easier for people to register? And what role does computer do computers play there? And what are some of the security concerns we have when we use computers for people to register online, for example. Is that doable? Is that sensible? And can we use that as a way to make sure we expand voting instead of constricting it? So, so it's, and I apologize for jumping in here again, but it, it's absolutely doable and it's being done now. Uh, there are several security precautions you have to ensure. One of those is that ultimately no changes are made in a voting record unless a live person approves it. Uh, that's the model that Colorado uses. Uh, for that live person to use it, they're using two-factor authentication uh, where you can't just get in through a hacked password. Uh, and so you've got steps along the way that verify. Frankly, the fact that voting rolls in most states are open to the public is another verification source so that anyone can look at it and say, yes, I know Bob Smith, he lives next door to me. Or they can look at it and go, Bob Smith, that's a vacant lot. And so there are a host of processes you use. Most states have some form of online voter registration. Uh, it can be done. Uh, there are precautions you need to take in place and to ensure it actually is that person. Uh, but those same precautions need to be in place with respect to a paper uh, signature verification that's submitted. Um, so it, I think it can be done. And most states are doing it at the present time, but you have to make sure you've got those precautions. There were, in the 2016 presidential election, there were efforts to get into the voter registration databases of multiple states. That continued through 2020 and 2016. I think there were two that had a potential vulnerability, um, Illinois and one other. Um, and so we want to, you know, there are precautions you have to take. It's one of the great things that Homeland Security's efforts in this area have provided uh, to help states and localities make sure uh, that they're secure. Jennifer and Kami, do you have any additional thoughts on that? Just a quick thought there. Um, there's a real opportunity still uh, when we talk about, well, first of all, let's just answer the question. I think, uh, as Wayne mentioned, having online registration is essential. And I'm a big fan of the states and jurisdictions that have adopted automatic voter registration. But one of the one of the nice things is when you're able to tap into uh, other state and federal agency data, it just sort of adds to your ability to sort of verify or validate that data. So there's a really nice effort. Um, I think Wayne mentioned it, uh, the electronic registration information sharing. But I would just add, convenience is great uh, for those that are nervous about that or nervous about this idea of online registration or registering, registering at different agencies. Uh, the more we sort of can share data on uh, when people move, uh, death records, uh, marriage records, incarceration, those sorts of things, that's where we can improve the integrity. 
And how about same day registration, by the way? Is that something we could do? Cami, you were gonna jump in. So we have a version of same day registration in California, it's called conditional same day registration. It allows us to, it's sort of like a provisional ballot process. I think uh, the ability to register on election day is important, especially for people who have moved. We don't wanna disenfranchise voters. We want to invite voters into the process. But to um, just talk about a little bit of the caution on the online registration, although I do think that it has um, expanded the number of people in our voter rolls, there are issues that need to be addressed still. Uh, historically, uh, this is done through a Department of Motor Vehicle signature match, and signatures on driver's license are not very readable. They're, they usually do not look like they would on a voter um, on a ballot that you're returning by mail. And there have been security breaches. There have been additional issues that states that are considering adopting it do need to look at, and we should be continuing to look at security in that area to make sure that we're not unintentionally uh, causing more problems for voters than they would if they registered with a paper ballot. And then your very first question is about how we can make it more accessible. We also need to be really careful that there are a lot of people in this country that still don't have access to the internet. Um, there is still a very real digital divide between rural and urban. So we need to ensure that we're still providing those in-person opportunities to register to vote in the traditional methods. And signature verification, is that an issue? Phil, looks like you might have something to say about that. I, I was gonna chime in briefly on uh, the question of voter register, online voter registration and online voter re registration databases. So they, they are vulnerable, but there are best practices to secure them, including you know, very frequent backups and then checking for differences between today's record and yesterday's record to make sure that um, you didn't have 5 million records changed um, and so on. So um, there's no way to get rid of the vulnerability, but again, there's a way to make end runs around the vulnerabilities to, to ensure that you can detect problems if they occurred. Signature ver verification is really troubling, um, uh, partly for the reason that uh, Kami mentioned, that when you capture a signature on a tablet, when someone is uh, renewing their driver's license, that doesn't look like a wet signature. People's signatures change over time. There are not good standards for comparing the signature on, say, an absentee ballot to the signature of record. Some of those, uh, some of it is done uh, in an automated way. They're automated signature verification things. There's no standards for those. Um, it, often the people who are doing this aren't necessarily trained well. And there isn't a lot of work that's been done to even measure sort of the type one and type two errors. That is the false negatives and false positives. So I, I see that as, a, as an issue. There are states in which it is now illegal to check the signature against a reference signature, I guess because it had been done so poorly in the past. All that officials are allowed to do is check that there is a signature. Um, and then similarly, if we're talking again about uh, uh, absentee voting rather than voter registration. Um, Georgia is poised to pass some new legislation involving taking a photocopy of driver's license and sizes and getting an attestation of this and that. And it's just, it's not, it hasn't been well thought out. It's probably going to reduce security rather than increase security. There are just complicated problems around, around all of this. Um, signatures are just, they're not a great way to verify who people are, but requiring photo ID can have the effect of disenfranchising some groups. Um, it's, 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 it's problematic. I don't think we have a really good answer the best answer historically that we've had is in-person voting in local polling places where it is your neighbors who are checking you in in the poll book and they know you. They recognize whether you are the person who goes with that name. Um, as we move to things like vote centers and whatnot, we're actually losing that security that comes from you know eyeballs, familiar eyeballs on other people. So just let's talk a little bit about the overall security of mail-in ballots. That, of course, was a big issue in this last election. Mail-in ballots, of course, to some extent were made necessary by COVID, but nevertheless, that's clearly been one of the claims of the Trump uh, administration and, and those uh, in league with him. And what do you think? I mean, is it possible to make mail-in ballots, sometimes called absentee ballots, actually secure? Yeah. After you. Yeah. No, I, I would say absolutely. Um, there do, again, we 
need to be able to make sure that we are going to mitigate for any of the vulnerabilities. But people who want to vote by mail uh, should be able to vote by mail. We should be able to come up with systems that we can verify and that the voter can verify that we received the ballot. And if there's an issue with the validation, they should be contacted and given the opportunity to correct what that issue is. The current systems that we have in place, at least here in California, there's even if a voter received two ballots in the mail, oftentimes it's because they re-registered during that six to eight week voting period. We can only check in one ballot per voter. So uh, we do have uh, protections in place for all of the vulnerabilities that we know about. And I think people who choose to vote by mail uh, should be able to have confidence that their ballot is going to be counted and counted as cast. Anybody and else? I'll just tack on to that, uh, agree with that, Cami. And in addition to those, uh, some of those things that she talked about in terms of like the front uh, verification of, of voters' identity, the signature matching that we just talked about, this is where that, that chain of custody, those standard operating procedures, those reconciliation logs, those batch control logs really come into play where there's an opportunity from the time that that ballot arrives in the election facility or is put into a ballot drop box uh, as the election official, you can track that, account for that. Um, Wayne mentioned the bipartisan teams. So all the way through, we have, we have the ability to sort of verify uh, as ballots move, right? We take some out of the system because of, of signature issues. Uh, some have to be removed to be duplicated. There are different reasons why those numbers are changing, but there actually is some pretty easy sort of basic principles to account for those as we get all the way through uh, the casting and counting of those ballots. So from, from the back end, from the operational end, I would say absolutely, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty secure process. And just one little note on the signature verification piece, uh, states that have been doing mail ballots for a while, so Colorado, Washington, and others, actually have done a, a pretty fair job. I recognize all the problems uh, and I don't discount those, but they've done a great job in sort of thinking about uh, tiered verification uh, audits. So taking samples, uh, this is something uh, Colorado did, it requires you to sort of pull a sample of, of signatures uh, to make sure that the people or the equipment that are verifying those are, are doing that accurately creating some sort of standards when it comes to training, working closely with local uh, FBI and other partners uh, to, to sort of understand what that training might look like, knowing that again, signature verification, sometimes less of a science um, and more of an art, but I think there certainly are good practices that should uh, help voters feel confident that once that ballot reaches the election office or is put into a drop box, that it's gonna be uh, secured and accounted for. Yeah, let me let me follow up with what Jennifer just said. So Colorado is one of the three states that mails a ballot to every voter. Uh, so we've been and we've been doing it for longer because we had no excuse absentee, and then we had the option to become a permanent mail-in voter. Uh, and because of that, we did adopt standards. And, and Philip's right. If you don't have standards, if you don't have training, then it's not as secure as it needs to be. Uh, so Colorado does have those standards. We do have that training. We also require election judges uh, or clerks rather to update uh, that signature. So after every election. Uh, so at, as Philip pointed out, signatures do change over time. So one of the things we do is we keep a running record and election judges can go back and review those past records. Uh, so all of that are part of what we have in our database that makes our elections in Colorado work. I will say that if you do not have some way of verifying who sent that ballot, a system that simply says, as long as there is a signature on the signature line is not secure. Because at that point, Right. That's where the stories come from of, hey, there were a bunch of ballots at the post office. Someone grabbed the envelopes and turned them in. And if you don't check <laughs> signatures, that's a huge issue. But in Colorado, we have our processes in place and it is there. And as Jennifer pointed out, we established audit standards for both people and for automatic machines that do uh, and, and we limit uh, the number that can be accepted uh, and we verify that those are accurate. Now, is it possible that someone can forge a signature? Absolutely. So it's not perfect, 
but it's also very possible for someone to walk into a polling place and say that they are an individual. And while the wonderful idyllic world of I know all my neighbors in a precinct might have once been the case in the United States, but I will tell you there's lots of places where people don't know the other people that live in the apartment building and the person next to them pulls into their garage uh, when they get home and they would they don't even know who lives there and so that 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 idyllic view of the way elections used to be conducted uh, certainly would provide verification right if this is my brother I know him he's here I'm related to everybody in the precinct I know all of them but that's not the reality of American society today and and so we as election officials can't I'm not trying to pick on my friend. We, we, we have to adjust to changing times, but we have to have standards that are followed up on. And if there are improvements, we, can, we need to adopt those. Are there ways going forward that we may look at different things? Sure, there may be some other biometric uh, that can be used. There are other things that may be there at some point in the future, but whether you, you know, whether you walk into a polling place or return a ballot, we do need to have some verification process that takes place. So let me just talk a little bit about uh, this issue, which is uh, that some people are asking whether we need national standards in this area. We could even think about going as far as places like India where there's a national agency that takes care of all the voting systems. I wanna talk a little bit about national standards and at the same time, whether it's a good thing that we have such a decentralized system and how much more centralized should it be? Should it be just at the level of standards or should it even go further than that? And what are the strengths and weaknesses of this system that we have, which is 3,000 counties and maybe 10,000 election uh, uh, agencies in the country? I can weigh in here. So there are sometimes areas that would lend itself to federal standards. I think the Help America Vote Act with um, guaranteeing provisional ballots and making sure that we um, request and need to verify driver's licenses and social security numbers on the front end of voter registration. I think that's a good example of a compromise that was made in 2002 after that contentious election that you were involved in, Henry. But as far as national federal elections, it's just way too difficult to the United States because even in California, voting in Los Angeles is very different than voting in a new county. And so trying to come up with a system that will work for all of us in the different areas that we live, the different ways that we communicate, the way whether we're very rural and we're um, living close-knit in an urban community, it's going to require flexibility. And so it is something that this, the country should be looking at for certain standards, I would say, but it should not be federalized as well as the decentralizing nature does lend itself to this issue of trust that we talked about in the beginning. My voters know me. I can go into my community. I see them in the grocery store. I, our kids grew up together. So when I have heard these accusations of vote rigging in the, the 2020 election and the 2016 election, oftentimes what I hear is, well, we know that we trust you. We know that you did it right. You, you could prove it to us. I'm not sure about everywhere else in the country, but, but we have a lot of faith and confidence in you as a community member. So if all of the election officials could cultivate that relationship with their communities, that's how you're going to build trust across the nation. Yeah, and I don't, I've been involved with the National Association of Secretaries of State and, and a host of other organizations. I don't think you want, the federal government trying to micromanage how things work in each community. And, and I'll give you two really contrasting examples. Uh, Colorado, where we mail about to everybody in New Hampshire, where it's really hard to get an absentee ballot normally and everyone votes in person. Both of those states are amongst the nation's leaders in voter participation. Uh, and what works in New Hampshire would not work in Colorado and perhaps vice versa. But we have complicated ballot issues in Colorado. We trust our voters to make debt decisions and tax decisions. And so people like to get a, a ballot they can review those on ahead of time, whereas some states don't. You don't have complicated ballot issues. 
I was at the Alaska um, uh, elections office in the midst of one of their primaries, and they were getting ready to send out ballots, and they had to do it on a particular day because the community only got mail delivery once a week. Uh, and, and so that's something that most of the rest of us aren't having to deal with because we have roads that go to our towns. You don't have to get it into the weekly plane that goes there. Uh, and so hey, Senator I want Bennett, to get Phil in here, by the way, because he's been trying to get in as well. So. Okay. So, but that's, so there are some minimum standards that are appropriate, uh, but I will point out, for example, HR1 currently, uh, I think just passed the house, would strike down Colorado's mail ballot process uh, in terms of signature verification and some other issues. It would cause some excessively long delays before you knew results, which as we know, the longer it is before you know results, the more concern that you get. Uh, and so those are some of the things that, that make it so I am not interested in the federal government telling me everything I need to know. But when I look at the Voting Rights Act and the Help America Vote Act, there are certainly some appropriate levels for the federal government. Phil. Uh, sorry. So I, I was going to say, I, I think there's ways in which we're erring too far in the other direction. Um, for example, the Election Assistance Commission is reluctant to even enunciate best practices for use of equipment because that's perceived by states as infringing on states' rights, even if they don't say you must do this, or they just say, here's a really good idea about how to use this equipment, and this would be this this other way of using it wouldn't be as secure. Um, I hope that we get some federal legislation around auditing um, and around ensuring the trustworthiness of the paper trail. Um, that said, I mean, I completely agree with everything Wayne said that we need flexibility to run elections in a way that accommodates the logistic restrictions of you know, the locations in which we run the elections of, of individual uh, jurisdictions. But that said, we need to make sure that at the end of the day, we have elections that we can trust. And that may require, so enunciating principles at a high level may be the way to get there rather than micromanaging. Um, Jennifer, uh, how about this question? You may wanna also discuss what we've been discussing, but. Are we risking voter suppression uh, in our effort to make elections more perfectly secure? What's the trade-off here? Uh, we all want to make sure that we have a real democracy where everybody gets a chance to vote. We already know that the disparities are really unconscionable. Uh, don't we have to worry about making them worse? Yeah, I think we absolutely do. And I think uh, it would be unwise to say that best adopting national standards or best practices means we have to give up local control or our decentralized model. I think both can exist together. Um, you know, and a really good example of that, uh, talking about, uh, you know, making sure that we don't disenfranchise voters is it's generally accepted across all 50 states that if a voter comes in to vote in person and their name can't be found in the poll book or their information, uh, there's an issue with their information that they'll be issued a provisional ballot and that that will be researched and a determined determination made at a later point. So I think there are certainly ways that we can continue to put uh, voters first to ensure, um, and I'll, I'll say it, people cringe when I say easy access, but I think we need to make it easy uh, to vote. Uh, I, I don't think that we have to sacrifice that uh, for better security, for auditability, for trustworthiness. Uh, we certainly have really good examples of, of entire states and jurisdictions across the country who, who do both really, really well. I wanna ask a big question here, uh, which is uh, Phil usefully made the distinction between being trusted and being trustworthy and argued that in fact, he's not sure that the systems right now are as trustworthy as they might be and we have to improve them. On the other hand, trust is a complicated thing and it's not just a function of trustworthiness of the system. It's also, as others have pointed out, like Cami, it's a function of the trustworthiness of the people involved. So my question is, what's the right mixture of things that we've got to have here in order to increase trust? Uh, I trust Cami, obviously, she, she just looks so trustworthy. And uh, I frankly don't care that much about the procedures because they're too complicated. Uh, and so maybe that's enough. 
Well, if I could weigh in here since you invoked my name. Um, I, when, I, when I say that my community trusts me, I've run 22 elections here. I, and I do it with um, uh, that concept of evidence-based election. That's a, a new um, language that I'm using, thanks to Dr. Stark and others, but that's, that was the idea all along is, you don't have to trust me, let me show you. And usually the people who are the most vocal in my community that are um, concerned about whether or not the election is gonna be conducted properly, the first thing I do is invite them in. Come on down, see my process, be a poll worker, help me count on election night, come and help me process absentee ballots behind the scenes. And that is how you cultivate trust over time. So my community, hopefully the majority of them, think that I'm trustworthy because I've proven to them over time that the, the elections have been conducted properly by showing them through evidence. And then eventually they build that, that relationship to where then they might not have to check the evidence, but anyone that's new in the community or anyone outside of the community that's questioning why there's only a 14 to vote difference and did we actually rig the election here in Inyo County, I can show them that we didn't. So these factors interact. Phil, what's your thought? Well, I think that the, the gold standard would be to for elections to provide public evidence that justifies trust. Um, we shouldn't have to trust individuals uh, in, to, 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 in order to have trust in the outcome of the election. Um, I, I think I should mention at least the existence of end-to-end -end cryptographically verifiable voting systems, which I think are not yet really ready for prime time. Uh, generally, they haven't been found to be terribly usable, but they do provide another way of making an end run around the trustworthiness of the system to have some trust in the result. Um, they don't give you exactly the same kinds of guarantees that a paper-based system would, but they're but they're they're very similar. So um, one thing I think it's important also to mention is that transparency doesn't necessarily inspire trust, and radical transparency isn't needed to justify trust. That there are key things that one needs to know at various steps along the way. You have to have some evidence that the paper trail was really kept secure. How do you do that? Well, you have two person chain of custody rules and maybe a video camera on the cage where the ballots are kept. Uh, you, you have appropriate use of seals, et cetera, and you document it all and you make all of that available to the public. Um, that doesn't mean that, that a member of the public has to accompany the ballots uh, for every stage of the process. Um, similarly, one of the things that Cami piloted uh, very recently uh, is a way of convincing the public that the electronic vote records that are used as part of the audit, as sort of auxiliary data for the audit, are in, do indeed reproduce the outcome of the election and are indeed the ones that were used in the audit um, without revealing uh, the, the, an entire cast vote record, like the whole list of selections that any individual made because there's a possibility that revealing that could compromise voter privacy. So she used a, a, a novel cryptographic approach to doing that, um, that, main, that, that again means that Anyone who wants to check the audit can check can check it without necessarily having access to all of the underlying data. You don't need radical transparency to have enough information to justify trust. So we're gonna to go to Wayne in a minute, but let me just first say that I think one of the goals here might be to involve as many people in the process so that if you were really trying to do something to manipulate it, there might be at least one of those people who would speak out and say, I was approached and asked to do something that I really can't do because it's not right. And therefore we would have a human who would might testify as to what the difficulties were. Wayne, uh, your thoughts. Yeah, so I, I wanted to follow up first. Philip's right, absolutely. The EAC should not be afraid to tell people what best practices are. We need that. Certainly we've had Homeland Security do that in terms of uh, a number of security issues. We need the EAC to do that. Uh, I'm not opposed, and I, I support them providing that information. I just don't want the mandate. You asked a question, though, about vote suppression that I think is really important. There is an impact with respect to vote suppression if people don't trust the election system. So one of the critical reasons why we're having this discussion about evidence-based elections is we want people to have confidence in the elections so they are more likely to vote. And the easiest way to suppress somebody from voting in this day and age is to tell them their vote doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter how you vote. It's, it's already been determined what's going to happen. And so we have to have processes that provide things. And so in response to your question, I would say that not providing election security is actually what suppresses votes because people are less likely to vote if they don't think their vote's going to count. So Jennifer, we're going to end uh, after hearing from you. And uh, what are your thoughts to end us? Good. Yeah, so I, I love that you brought up uh, that this is a citizen-based uh, process. And I think you're absolutely right. I think when we have uh, citizens, and we saw this sort of remarkable recruitment effort this year, who are willing to step up, and whether that's helping in a central count facility, uh, working in, in, as a poll worker, administering voting in person, uh, those are those hundreds of thousands of witnesses uh, to the credibility and the reliability of the process. Is it 100% perfect? No, because it's a human process and we're always going to have um, issues or errors. That's why we need some standards uh, around audits, but uh, I certainly uh, would echo what you said and, and the other panelists that uh, if people are concerned, if they legitimately feel like uh, things aren't running the way they need to be, uh, step up and volunteer, uh, step up and help. Thank you. This has really been a terrific panel. I wish we had more time. And it's partly I'm an election group, uh, groupie and I love this kind of discussion and I think it's extraordinarily important. And I love the way you ended there, uh, Jennifer. I think the idea is that this is about people getting involved, seeing it up close, recognizing that in fact, it is a process where people are trying to be as careful as they possibly can be. And I think that'll create more uh, trust in elections uh, and hopefully more trustworthiness as Bill would hope for. Um, so thank you everybody. Let me thank uh, Cammie Foote, uh, Jennifer Morrill, uh, Phil Stark, and Wayne Williams. Thanks so much. I wanna thank Janet Napolitano and her Center for Security and Politics, which has had just an absolutely terrific set of panels today, uh, which really have run the full gamut of what the, is going on in elections in America right now, and actually in the world, because the first panel did that as well. And thanks to the audience for tuning in. Thank you for being here. A great set of questions you put forth. And then let me just finally say, there will be a recording of this event and the others included in the symposium and prior events sponsored by the Center for Security and Politics. And they'll be available at www.uctv slash public dash policy. So that's www.uctv.tv slash public dash policy. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to Janet Napolitano and her center. Thanks for all the great work you're doing. And thank you for trying to make and helping to make elections more secure in America. Thank you. Thank you all. Great panel. <laughs>